Anyway, I, uh, today and, and really next week as well, I'm going to talk about two things that I believe are uh, very neglected in our modern church today. Uh, maybe the two most important things that have been neglected in the modern church, especially in the, the churches of the United States of America. Now, one has to do with those who claim to be very near to God, and that this morning, and the other one has to do with those who, who are very far away from God. And we'll look at that next week. So if you know somebody that's very far away from God, it might be a good idea to invite them next week. Or maybe you're here this morning and you're just starting to figure out, is Jesus exactly who he says he is or is he not? And, and, and if that's you this morning, then uh, maybe uh, come back next week if possible and, and see what we have to say. So this week, uh, if you're not a Christian, uh, you can sit back and listen to the message and you really don't have to do a whole lot about it. Uh, you, you, you get to probably sit back and say, you know, all those things I thought about those people, I was exactly right. You know, they are hypocrites. They don't do everything they're supposed to. But it's like an old pastor told me one time, if this is God, and this is you, and you love a hypocrite, get between you and God, which one of you is closer? Hmm. <laughs> anyway, these songs we're going to talk about are um, um, what Jesus taught. It's what he taught his apostles and his disciples to teach, and it's what the forerunner, the one who came to announce Jesus' ministry talk as well. So, now, the, the person we're talking about, uh, and we've been calling this series, Seeing Jesus Through the Eyes of the Faithful and Deserter, is the uh, John Mark, the, the writer of the Gospel of Mark. And the writer of the Gospel of Mark opens his account of Jesus' life and his teachings in, in a very exciting, a very fast way, but these principles we're looking at is exactly how he opens his, his, his gospel. But uh, before we get started in this morning's message, I, mean, I do want to thank everybody for coming out again. Uh, I know schedules are busy and times are hectic, and, and some of us have the privilege of seeing people we haven't seen in many, many years, and yet you still take the time to come here and bring them with you, so I, I really appreciate that. <laughs> As well, and I see some new faces here this morning. And uh, again, last week we, uh, we we said, you know, let's strive for five. Uh, what that means is, you know, we may you may come today, and you may see that uh, today you didn't really like the message, you didn't like what went on, and uh, maybe we just had an off day. So if, if you come five consecutive weeks in a row, you get a real chance to check us out to see if we are who we say we are. Now I say that because. Uh, the church that I spent 12 years under, the, the pastor I spent 12 years under and 12 years at, uh, I went the first time with Janet, we were looking for a church, and the first time that I went there, um, I didn't like church at all, to be quite frank with you. And uh, we were looking for a church, so we continued to look for a church. My sister was born there, and she invited us to come back again one time, and, and we decided to do so. And when I went the second time, I fell in love with her. Like I said, we were there for about 12 years. We got very involved in the church and the children's ministry and the men's group and all these other things. So so if you come, the subscribe for five, I just challenge you, if this is your first or second time, you haven't come for a while, it's not about us. Let's first of all say that. It's about what God can do in your life. So if you're not, if you're attending another church, we, we don't want to steal sheep. But if you're not attending, you're not a regular attender, uh, we would love you just to give us a fair shake and, and come out uh, five weeks in a row. And, uh, that gives you a fair chance to see if it's really what we are, what we, we are. Maybe it's a place you'd like to hang out a little bit more at. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we're doing this study on Wednesday nights on the Holy Spirit. So here's what I know, and probably what you know, if you do like what's going on here, it's not because of us at all. It's always because of God the Father and His Holy Spirit. In fact, sometimes God the Father and His Holy Spirit has to work in spite of us, uh, as you've seen in the technical side of us this morning. <laughs> the other thing is, you know, I always remind people, try to remind myself as well, you always keep your eyes on Jesus and not on man. You know, I promise you this, I will never purposely let you down. I'll never purposely hurt you or say something the wrong thing, but I am human. And if you hang around with me long enough, I probably will in my humanness. Now, if you don't believe that, there's my wife said no there. You just ask her because she'll be more than glad to tell you about all the things. <laughs> I'd like to do it. That's a for five. Now, if you uh, missed last week, you might go to our website, www.theodsseachurch.com or youtube.com, and watch last week's message there. And it's not because of anything great that I said. Uh, but first of all, it was an introduction lesson. And in an introduction lesson, we gave a lot of facts, 
about the gospel of Mark. We gave why we're calling him the faithful deserve. We gave a lot of facts about uh, Mark, John Mark himself. And uh, I had the opportunity to share a little bit of my uh, personal testimony. Uh, but this morning, I don't want to go back over that. That's why I asked you to go there and watch it, because I speak long enough as it is. And uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on you. But still, I, I would encourage you, right, because there's a lot of history and a lot of information that's packed into that first, uh, first lesson. And the second thing is, like I said, I got a chance to share a lot of my personal testimony growing up and some of the things that I did. I'm not telling you to watch it so you can go out and tell everybody what terrible sinner I am, or I was. Mm -hmm. Enough people doing that, trust me. So uh, it, it's just, uh, it's just, it, it, if you know somebody who is very far away from God, if you know somebody uh, who maybe don't even think that Jesus is who he says he is, it, it also give you hope. Because if God can bring me to the saving grace of Jesus Christ, the salvation of sins of being forgiven. He can bring anybody there. So, Amen. I like one of the quotes that I heard through Facebook. Somebody sent me, I got a friend of mine uh, that I had the honor and privilege of performing with. They were talking about the things we did, and uh, then she sent me this post. She said, I'm so glad I was young, wild, and crazy before there were cell phones and evidence. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> seems like when you put it out there today, it's out there forever. I had a pastor friend of mine was interviewing somebody at one time for a youth position. And he was asking him all the personal questions, what his personal life was like. And, you know, he's got, got a smartphone. And the guy was telling him how perfect he was and everything else. And while he's talking, he pulled up his Facebook account and said, well, what about this? Oh. And obviously the guy left him. He'd come back and didn't get the job. But um, I didn't really know cell phones when I was growing up. <laughs> so, I'm, again, uh, it's just encouraging to know that uh, no matter where you're at or what you've done, uh, we serve this God that loves us so much. He's just, he's just waiting for us to turn around and come to him. Amen. So this morning, I, I'm going to pick up where I, I left off last week. And as I mentioned earlier last week, was the introduction lesson. And we ended by reading the first eight verses in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, this Gospel, John Mark, as he's also known, uh, is faithful deserter. If you don't know why we're calling him the faithful deserter, well, I'm not going to tell you this week. you got to go watch the message last week. So... Mark, Mark is a, a, like an action-packed uh, gospel, you know. One of the things about Mark is he skips right over uh, uh, the lineage of Jesus, which Matthew, Mark, and uh, picked up greatly. And he skips over the genealogy. He skips over the birth of Jesus. In fact, he, he uh, goes straight into the uh, action. He actually skips over the first 30 years of Jesus' life and gets right into his ministry. So if you like movies with a lot of excitement, uh, I would encourage you to read the Gospel of Mark. The uh, Gospel of Mark uh, lists more miracles than uh, any of the other Gospel writers. And, and John Mark, as he's also known, talks more about the miracles of Jesus than any other Gospel But he also teaches less about the teachings of Jesus. He, uh, he skips over a lot of that. He just goes right into the action. So John Mark starts right out with John the Baptist announcing the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Literally in the Greek, what it reads is John, uh, we, we translate it John the Baptist, but it would actually read John the one who baptizes. So he was actually not John the Baptist, he was John the baptizer. Now I only say that because I met a lady one time and she said, you know, I'm Baptist because that is the only denomination mentioned in the Bible. <laughs> well, let me tell you, uh, John the Baptist wasn't Baptist. Uh, I mean, there weren't any churches. There wasn't even, uh, uh, Christ hasn't uh, even come on the scene at this point in time. So there were no Christians either. Uh, John baptized, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, or come back, we'll talk a whole lot about that next week. But John the Baptizer starts out, as John the Mark reports, introducing and telling of uh, the Messiah, the Son of God. So we're going to pick up last week exactly where we dropped off, and I'm going to read the first eight verses of the Gospel of Mark, and I, and I may need your help there, Ricky, a little bit. We're going to see if this works. And in these first eight verses, as I mentioned last week, there are four truths of God. Now, if, if, if you're reading with me and you have a translation differently, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. We've got a couple of them over here. They're free. They're yours. We want you to have them. It's the only book that I know. It's the only book I've ever found that this not is only informational, but it's transformational. 
the scriptures will transform you and transform your life. And we want as many people to have them in their hands as possible. So if you want a Bible, they're right over there. I'd be glad to give you one, and I'll have more word this week. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna like I said we're gonna we're gonna pick up right where I dropped off last week with these four truths of God, two of which are, are really taught in all churches all the time, all across the world. And two of them are going to have some hidden truths, which uh, I believe are very neglected in our modern church. So, reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 8. This is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. Look, I am sending you my messenger. Ahead of you, he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, went to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. John announced, Someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater than I am not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. I will baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, as we look at this, in just the first eight verses of the Gospel of Mark, we see these four great truths of God. And they all look like something which is taught in all the churches today, but two of them have hidden doctrines, what I believe the modern church seems to have forgotten. So in the middle, these truths, uh, they all bring comfort. First of all, I want you to know that, because uh, gospel actually means good news, so it can't be gospel unless it's good news. And they look great. But, but let me ask you this. Have you ever had a sandwich and, and you look at it and the bread is exactly your favorite kind of bread? It's plump, it's soft, it smells so good. And you see the meat and it looks like the perfect sandwich. And then you bite into it and there's something sort of hidden in the middle. Yes. Maybe like mustard instead of mayo. And you like mayo, but you know you weren't expecting it. So it, it takes you a little while to get used to it. Well, on the outside, the first and the last verses are exactly what they seem to be. They're exactly the truth that we would expect. But sandwiched in the middle of the two, these two middle words are some very deeper truths that are unexpected, may even be unpleasant to hear and hard to swallow at first. But these are the truths of God that the seeker-sensitive church today doesn't always preach about. A.W. Tozer, and I don't know if you know who A.W. Tozer, he's a, a preacher of the past. I think he passed away somewhere in the 60s. Uh, he said this about the churches back in the 60s, which I think we've even come farther in the wrong direction sometimes than in the last 50 years. But uh, he makes this claim. He says that the church, that the church of the day is so watered down that if it was medicine, it wouldn't help anybody at all. And if it was poison, it wouldn't hurt anybody at all. Mm -hmm. And I believe there might be some truth to that. So here at the Austin Church, I just want you to know that we love you. And, and we truly do. And you might think to yourself, well, how do you know uh, that you love me? You don't even know me. You just met me. Well, I, I may not know that, but I know enough about Scripture to know that God loves you. And if God loves you, who am I not to love you? So Amen. we're here, and, and, and uh, I love you enough sometimes to even speak the hard truths mm -hmm. of the gospel. Uh, I want to speak the full counsel of the gospel. And the first truth, like I said, is a truth which is given, and we can't deny the first truth. It's preached in every church. It's a truth we need to hear often, and therefore it's a truth that we need to preach often. So here are the first truths we find in the first eight verses of the Gospel of Mark. First of all, uh, God always keeps his promises. That's the first truth, and I don't think anybody uh, would disagree with that. The second truth is this. God's promises are for those who are very far away from God. You can't be so far away from God that you can't turn around and run smack dab in front of God. Because you may have left Him, but I assure you, He has never left you. He's had your back the whole time. And, find, and then uh, the truth is for those who are very, very far away from God. So it's for those who are close and for those who are far away. And then finally, God's promises... Or for everybody. 
This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, keep in mind that his, the word gospel translated actually means good news. So John Mark starts his gospel out with the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, i got to let you know a couple things first. Jesus is actually uh, the English translation of a Greek word, Yeshua. And Yeshua means the Lord is salvation. So this is Jesus' name, Yeshua. The Lord is salvation. Now, in the Hebrew, Yeshua or Jesus is translated Joshua. You might even know a Joshua. It's a Hebrew name. It means the same thing. It means the Lord is salvation. But so often people think that Jesus is his first name and Christ is his last name. But that's not the case. Uh, Christ is his title, not his last name. John Mark starts out by telling us the good news of Jesus, the Messiah. Now, now I'm, again, I'm reading from the New English, or the New Living Translation. Some translations say Jesus Christ, and others say Jesus the Christ. But my Messiah this time is the Hebrew translation of Christos. In the Greek, which we translate Christ, it means the anointed one. So Jesus is his first name, and Christ is his title, and Messiah is the Hebrew translation. Christ is the uh, Greek translation. Jesus' name, the Christ, or the Messiah, title. But John Mark goes one step farther. He raises the stakes. He tells of Jesus' unique relationship with God the Father. John Mark starts the good news out by telling or affirming or verifying that Jesus is indeed of divine character. This is Yeshua, the anointed of God, the Son of God. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So John Mark, in these very first verses, we find uh, in these eight verses uh, uh, four truths. And then we start out, you know, God always keeps his promises. But we start out and began... We might be one king. Yeah, it began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. Look, I am setting my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare the way. Now, here's the thing. Jesus didn't come on the scene unexpected or unannounced. We think he just showed up one day, but that's not the case. The Old Testament clearly predicted the coming of a Messiah, a coming of the anointed one of God. Actually, in the book of Isaiah, it says that God himself will dwell among his people. There was a God who loved us enough that he would come in the form of man and offer eternal salvation. Yet many denied him and rejected him at that time. But in the same way today, and it's still the same way today. In today's world, Jesus is neither unannounced or unexpected. Yet still today, many people reject him and deny him. Even though the proof, the evidence, is overwhelming both in secular history and in uh, scriptural history, that he is exactly who he says he is. He is Christ, the Son of God. So the first truth is God always keeps his promise. It began just as he, God said he would. And Jesus fulfills these promises of the Old Testament. Now I've read that Jesus fulfilled as many as 353 of the prophecies in the Old Testament. I did not count that myself, but I did a lot of research, and at least three, you know, over 300, as high as 353 prophecies were fulfilled by Jesus Christ himself. And there was a mathematician that took some of the larger problems, like what we're talking about today in the Gospel of Mark, where uh, Mark uh, uh, predict, or where Isaiah predicted that John the Baptist would come on the scene, or somebody would come on the scene, a messenger from God to announce the coming of Jesus. The, the, the big prophecies like Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. He just took eight of those. And according to this mathematician, the odds of Jesus just fulfilling the eight prophecies that, that he chose was one in ten to the 28th power. That's one in ten with 28 zeros behind it. That is one in ten octillion. Now, that comes from the American standard of numbers. I didn't know what an octillion was. I had to look it up. But it's a lot. And if there's 10 of them, it's got to be a whole lot, right? So the odds are almost overwhelming 
When you think about 353 prophecies being fulfilled, that Jesus Christ is not exactly who he says he is. This is no coincidence. I read an article one time where uh, somebody took uh, the book of Isaiah and, and where it talks about Jesus and or talk, we read this prophecy about the one who's going to die on the cross and he's going to be beaten and all these things. And he puts it in a modern language like uh, the New Living Translation and takes it into a DMV and he asks everybody in there to read it, matter whether Christian, Jewish, Buddha, atheist, didn't matter, ask everyone in there to read it and tell them who it was talking about. Some of them had no knowledge of the Bible, but every single person knew it was Jesus Christ they were talking about. Mm. So the fact that mm -hmm. this is some kind of coincidence is almost impossible. So God's promises are always kept. God's promises are always fulfilled. And that's it. Exactly what you expect it to be. It's like that bread at the top. It's exactly what you thought it should be. It's preached in churches all over the world, and it should be because it's a truth. That, especially if you're going through difficult times, if you need to be reminded of, and we need to be reminded of often, God always keeps His promise. But this second truth, God's promises are for those who are very close to Him, and we know this to be true, right? I mean, if you're close to God then you know God's promises are for you. Amen. You know that. But so often, even people who consider themselves to be good, strong Christians think all they have to do is read their Bible, give some money away, and, and, and they're all good. They go to church a couple times a month. But I really don't believe it's that simple. When you hear the good news, you're supposed to get excited and tell people, Look, I am sending you a messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. See, God sent a messenger. God sent a messenger to announce he was coming in the body of man, that he was coming as Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. A voice shouting in the wilderness of this world of sin and preparing the way and clearing the path so others can come to Jesus Christ. That is what we are supposed to do. We're supposed to be a messenger to be a voice shouting in the wilderness. We're to prepare the way and clear the road for him. Where? John the Baptist was a forerunner. He went before Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. The forerunner was more than just a sign or a symbol of Jesus' arrival. The forerunner had a very specific task. And I think in this verse, these verses, God has given us a very physical picture of a spiritual truth. I believe in these verses, God is saying, if you say you're very near to me, if you say that you're a Christian, God is showing us we are forerunners of Jesus and we have a very specific task. The messenger is doing exactly what God the Son, Jesus Christ, tells his disciples to do as his last command after his resurrection before he goes back to sit at the right hand of his Father. And if you're a Christian, you're supposed to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. So in effect, he's telling you the same thing. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 28, Jesus' last command to his disciples is go and make disciples. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you. We're to be messengers of the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, according to Peter, and Peter was one of Jesus' closest friends on earth. He was also part of what we call the inner circle. He was one of three people that, that Jesus had a special ministry to. He was also the one, he was also the one that Jesus said he built his church upon, his Christians. He tells us that we are all called into ministry. First Peter chapter 2, verse 5, the apostle Peter writes, You are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are holy priest. Now that doesn't mean we're all called into a pastoral ministry. But as Christians, I believe we're all called into some kind of ministry. You know, whether it's a pastoral ministry, whether it's a youth ministry, whether it's a music ministry, whether it's other some kind of ministry, whether it's a personal ministry, we're all to be forerunners, we're all to be messengers of God, we're all to be a voice shouting in the wilderness of this world who is just sin-filled, and we're supposed to be preparing and clearing the roads that others can come to Jesus. We are to be messengers. We are to be messengers so others can turn to God instead of running away from God. Ricky, change the next line. Let me see what it says. Um, yeah. 
We're good. Uh, just leave it there. We'll buy it. Uh, so then, so the, the messengers, we are to announce, we are to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, the coming of God. This is a picture of what the church, and when I say the church, I mean the church with the capital C, the body of Christ, the living stones that God is building his spiritual temple around. We are supposed to do this. We're supposed to go out and make disciples by going out and being the messengers of God's love. We're supposed to go out and shout the announcing of his son, Jesus Christ, and his offer of forgiveness of sins. Here's the problem, and, and, and we all know this to be true. We don't mean to, but most, I, I don't believe there's any mean-spirited Christians out there with me. I mean, they all have good intentions, but so much, and I know I've done it too, so often, instead of being messenger love, you know, we end up being messengers of rules. We, be, we become messengers of regulations. We, we become messengers of law. If you don't look like me, and you don't act like me, and you don't look like what our church thinks you ought to look like, you can't be a Christian. Hallelujah. Somebody spoke the truth. Yes. <laughs> Amen. But, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Just because somebody sins differently than you, we ought not be condemning them. Instead of